So our next speaker is Prof. Takaki Kajita, who will be speaking on the neutrino oscillations. The Q&A session will be moderated by Prof. Don Tan from the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Prof. Kajita, please. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> uh, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction. Well, <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk about neutrino oscillations. And well, here in this slide, you see something. Uh, this is the Super Kamiokande detector. Uh, we have been working with this detector for many years, studying neutrinos. And therefore, my talk is essentially on neutrino oscillation studies in Super Kamiokande. Well, in fact, I have to apologize. Well, there have been many, many neutrino oscillation studies in the world, but I'm going to concentrate on the neutrino oscillation, oscillation studies in Super Kamiokande. <coughs> OK, so this is the outline. Uh, First, I will have a brief introduction on neutrinos. I assume that some of you are not familiar with the neutrinos. Then I want to discuss early days of studies in Kamioka, that is the location of our experiment. Then discovery of neutrino oscillations, importance of small neutrino mass, and before finishing, I want to briefly mention what I am doing now. And I will summarize this talk. OK, what are neutrinos? Well, uh, first of all, neutrinos are fundamental particles like electrons and quarks. <clears throat> neutrinos are something like, say, electrons but without electric charge. In fact, this feature, without electric charge, has a significant impact. Neutrinos can easily pass through even the Earth. But fortunately for physicists, they interact with matter very rarely. Therefore, we can study neutrinos. And neutrinos have three types, namely electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. And I want to say that neutrinos have been assumed to have no mass. And finally, neutrinos can be detected, like, like the figure shown here, where, of course, we, we can never see neutrinos themselves. But as I said, neutrinos really interact with matter. For example, a neutrino may interact with a nucleus. Then typically, a particle, charged particle, is emitted. And in fact, we have various ways to observe these charged particles. For example, if a nucleus is a water nucleus, then the charged particles should propagate in the water. Then photons are emitted. And therefore, if we have photodetectors, we can observe these photons. And this way, we can observe neutrino interactions. And this way, we study neutrinos. Now, I want to discuss our experiment in early days. Well, the history of our experiments started about half a century ago. In the 1970s, a new theory called Grand Unified Theory, or theories of elementary particles, appeared. And these theories predicted that protons should decay with a lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. Of course, 10 to 30 years is a very, very long lifetime. 
well, the present age of the universe is about 13.8 billion years, that is 10 to 10 years. Therefore, even compared with the age of the universe, the predicted proton lifetime was much longer. <laughs> However, if we observe 10 to 30 protons for a year, we should be able to observe one proton decay. And therefore, several proton decay experiments began in the early 80s, and one of them was the Kamiokande experiment. Well, as shown here, Kamiokande was a large water tank. It had about 60 meters in diameter and 60 meter high. And of course, it contains a lot of water, 3,000 ton of water, and therefore it contained really a lot of protons inside. Therefore, some of the protons may decay. And if a proton decay inside this tank, then typically two or three particles emitted, and these particles pro propagate in the water, and therefore we should be able to observe photons emitted by these photons. So this is the idea. And in fact, I was fascinated by the prediction of proton decay and participated in Kamiokande. At the time, I entered the graduate course. That was April 91. Well, first of all, of course, uh, well, these detectors does not exist. Therefore, we have to construct a detector. Well, this photo was taken in the spring of 1983. Well, our experimental team come to the site, uh, Kamioka uh, in Japan. And you see many of them, well, all of them, were in the safety hut. Well, because we go into the mine Therefore, uh, well, safety was an issue. <clears throat> and also, you see in the middle, there is a gentleman that is Professor Koshiba. That was my thesis advisor. And in fact, he was the leader of this experiment. And later, in 2002, he received Nobel Prize in Physics based on the neutrino studies in Kamiokande. Anyway, well, this photo was taken outside of the mine, but our experiment is, was actually inside the mine. Therefore, we had to go into the mine, and we indeed construct, constructed the Kamiokande detector. And this photo was taken when you are constructing the Kamiokande detector. I said, the Kamiokande was 16 meter high, and we needed to install the photodetectors onto the wall. Of course, 16 meter is very high. Therefore, the safety was an issue. And therefore, we decided to use these plastic boats to install the photodetectors onto the detector wall. Well, Certainly, the working condition was not very good, but even if you drop, you do not die, so it's okay. <laughs> anyway, well, I, I, I kind of enjoyed uh, this kind of work. And, well, actually, I, I, I want to say that one of them, one of the three people is me, myself, so I really enjoyed this kind of work. Anyway, the experiment started uh, in July 1983, and we wanted to observe proton decays. Um, unfortunately, proton lifetime was longer than expected, so we didn't observe proton decay signals. 
Instead, we observed background events, the most serious background to the search for proton decays, that was the neutrino interactions. And these neutrinos are created by cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. Um, well, if a cosmic ray interacts with the air nucleus, typically a pion is produced. Pion is, of course, unstable, decay to other particles. And actually, the produced particle is also unstable, decay to other particles. And during this decay chain, neutrinos are created. And, of course, most of them simply pass through even the Earth. But some of them interact in the Kamiokande detector. And these are the most serious background to the search for proton decays. Well, I want to mention, briefly discuss, about our studies in 1986. Well. In 1986, there was still no evidence for proton decays, but we still wanted to observe proton decays. Therefore, we thought we better separate proton decay signal and the neutrino background, and therefore, we developed a new software to improve the proton decay searches. And of course, if we write new software, we have to check this software as much as we can. And indeed, we did various tests. And as a kind of final test of the new software, the neutrino type, that means electron neutrino or muon neutrino, was studied for the atmospheric neutrino events. Then we found that the number of muon neutrino events was much fewer than expected. Well, of course, this was a test of the software. And software told us something unexpected. That means there must be some problem with the software. So we thought that it's very likely that there was some mistake in the new software. And therefore, we started studies to find mistake. In fact, well, around that time, 40 years ago, we had a lot of time. We studied for about one year just to find out what is wrong. But even after one year, we were unable to find any serious mistake. So then we decided that it is our duty to report our observation. In fact, we wrote a paper, but this paper was quite simple. Essentially, we reported the number of observed muon neutrino events, that was 85, and compared with the expectation, that was more than 140. Clearly, there was a significant deficit. Also, we counted the number of electron neutrino events, but for these events, the expectation and the observation agreed reasonably well. That's all we reported. Well, it was true that we had no clear idea what was the cause of the deficit. But I was most excited with the data. Well, until then, I was interested in the search for proton decays. But, well, to me, this problem was so, so serious. Therefore, I changed my research completely from proton decay searches to neutrino studies to know what is happening in neutrinos. Well, certainly, 
with the data alone, we cannot tell what was the cause of the deficit. But even from the early days, we have been thinking that maybe, this was just maybe, maybe the deficit was due to new gene oscillations. In fact, um, already in the 1960s, theorists predicted that if neutrinos have mass, neutrinos change their type from one type to the other. For example, as shown here, if a, neutrino, a mu one neutrino is produced and begin to propagate to the right, then at some point, the probability that mu one neutrino to remain as mu one neutrino is very low. But if this particle still propagate, then at some point, the muon neutrino recover to muon neutrino. And when muon neutrino is disappearing, another type of neutrino, in this case, tau neutrino, is appearing. So this is neutrino oscillations. And if this is happening, then one can naturally explain the data. However, at the same time, you can imagine various other possible explanations. Therefore, therefore, we thought we need to further, we need to study further. And for this, we thought this way. Well, as I said, neutrinos are created by cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere. Uh, therefore, some of these neutrinos are created above the detector, typically 10 to 20 kilometers above the detector. And these neutrinos come to the detector after traveling a short distance, 10 to 20 kilometers. And these neutrinos may, have not, may not have enough time to oscillate. At the same time, neutrinos are created in the other side of the Earth. And these neutrinos have long distance before interacting in the Kamiokande detector. And therefore, these neutrinos may oscillate. So if we think this way, um, we, we think, we, we thought that we should observe the passes down asymmetry of the atmospheric muon neutrinos. Unfortunately, the Kamiokande detector was just too small to observe this effect. So we needed a much larger detector, and that was Super Kamiokande. Now I want to move on to the uh, discovery of neutrino oscillations in Super Kamiokande. Well, Super Kamiokande is a much larger version of the original Kamiokande detector. It has about essentially 40 meters in diameter and 40 meters in height. And it contains 50,000 tons of very clean water. <clears throat> so this way, we can observe many neutrino interactions. Uh, but well, before starting the experiment, of course, we have to construct the detector. And again, we came to underground to construct the detector. And this photo was taken in the spring of 95. So every day, these many people come to the detector, uh, well, come to underground to construct the detector. Well, in fact, the, ex well, the construction was successful. And this photo was taken in January 96, when we essentially finished the construction and we started filling the detector with pure water. And the experiment started on April 1st, 96. And this is just one example of the neutrino interaction observed in Super Kamiokande. So you can see a ring pattern of the light. And this is, in fact, a typical uh, neutrino interaction. 
So, well, at that time, we have more than 100 collaborators, and these collaborators work together to analyze these data. And indeed, I think we worked efficiently. And in two years, uh, we were able to report our first significant result. Uh, by, by the way, that was more than 25 years ago. And the presentation technology was quite different. We didn't have PowerPoint at that time. So we had the uh, transparent plastic sheet, copying the data histogram, and writing down various comments. So this was the one of the slides. And well, but still, uh, this was important. The bottom one is for muon neutrino interactions. And the horizontal axis is, is the neutrino arrival direction. Cosine theta 1 means downgoing neutrinos. Minus 1 means upward going neutrinos coming from the other side of the Earth. Then the black circles show the data, and hatched histogram shows the Monte Carlo prediction, prediction without neutrino oscillations. Then you find for downgoing neutrinos, the data and the prediction agreed well. But for the upward going neutrinos, there was essentially a factor of two deficit compared to the, with the expectation. And well, this data is very well explained if we assume neutrino oscillations, namely neutrinos coming from the other side of the Earth, oscillate before interacting in super Kamiokande. So this was the discovery of neutrino oscillations. And of course, we reported this discovery at the conference for neutrino physicists. Then, well, there was something unexpected happened. There was a an, an talk by President Clinton of the USA at MIT, MIT's commencement. And in his talk, he mentioned about, about our result. Well, the whole talk was about 30 minutes, but well, in the middle, he mentioned just yesterday in Japan, physicists announced a discovery that tiny neutrinos have mass. Now, that may not mean much to most Americans, but it may change our most fundamental theories from the nature of the smallest subatomic particles to how the universe itself works and indeed how it expands. And of course, as the US president, he mentioned Super Kamiokande is a collaboration between US and Japan, of course. And then he continued, the larger issue is that these kinds of findings have implications that are not limited to the laboratory. They affect the whole of society, not only our economy, but our very view of life, our understanding of our relations with others, and our place in time. So I think this was really an honor to hear this kind of remark by the US president. And in fact, well, not only the president, but all the neutrino community was excited uh, with this uh, discovery. And since then, in the last 25 years, people have been studying neutrino oscillations very, very extensively. Now, I'd like to mention why we are excited with the neutrino oscillation or new, small neutrino mass. Well, here I show the mass of particles. There are three types of charged leptons and six types of quarks. And the mass of these particles are shown here. And now, as I said, in the last 25 years, neutrino physicists have been studying extensively on the neutrino mass and mixings. And therefore, we know the neutrino mass rather well. And if we plot 
the neutrino mass, they are here. Oh, oh yes. OK. So uh, first of all, you find that neutrino mass are plotted uh, in a very different place in this graph. In fact, if you simply read this graph, you find that the neutrino mass is approximately, or maybe more than, 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the corresponding mass of quarks and charged leptons. 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the other particles' mass. Very small. And we believe this is the key to better understand elementary particles and the universe. And therefore, we are excited. Certainly, if we understand why neutrino mass are so small, we understand better about particles. But we think not only particles, uh, small neutrino mass could be related to our understanding of the universe. Why? Well, so. This is the photo of the far universe. Um, you see many galaxies. And we know these galaxies are made of matter. We know that there are no antimatter galaxy. Well, that is trivial. But if we think about the uh, history of the universe, starting with Big Bang, we find we do not understand why the present day universe is dominated by matter. Because in the Big Bang universe, because of the extremely high temperature, always particles and antiparticles are created simultaneously. Therefore, in the Big Bang universe, there should have been equal number of matter and antimatter particles. Then, with the universe cooled down, particles and antiparticles meet and annihilate. Therefore, at present, there should be nothing. But, well, certainly, experimentally, we know we exist. So, this is the mystery we have to understand. Unfortunately, we do not know what happened, but there is an interesting theoretical idea that neutrinos with very small mass might be the key to understand the big, this big mystery of the matter in the universe. So the whole neutrino community are still excited with the small neutrino mass, and we'd like to understand the mystery of the matter in the universe with the neutrinos. OK, well, essentially I'm finishing. But before finishing, I want to discuss what I am doing now. Well, today I talked about my research history, say, 20, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Well. Certainly, uh, I studied neutrinos for many years, more than 20 years. And in fact, after the discovery of neutrino oscillations in 1998, and after some more studies for uh, several more years, I was feeling that I finished what I should do in my neutrino research. On the other hand, there are still many exciting things that we do not know. In particular, gravitational waves had not yet discovered at that time. That was early this century. And I was fascinated by the research on gravitational waves and the studies of the universe with gravitational waves. And then in 2008, I was appointed the director of the Institute for Cosmic Ray Research, our institute. And it was clear that 
I could no longer contribute to neutrino research much. Well, I had to spend most of my time as the director, but I still wanted to be involved in exciting research, and therefore I decided to participate in the gravitational wave project, which is called Kagura, with my partial time. Well, Kagura is a very large laser interferometer located in underground, well, in fact, in, in the same mountain as Super Kamiokande. It has about three kilometer by three kilometer arm lengths, very long, uh, very big interferometer, and in fact, very big and very complicated uh, interferometer. And this project was approved in 2010, and I have been saying that we are going to start the serious observation from the spring of this year. Then, unfortunately, there was a big earthquake on January 1st near this site. And unfortunately, the, well, this was a very uh, complicated, very uh, well, uh, delicate instrument. Therefore, there, were, there was a serious effect of the earthquake. Therefore, from now on, we begin the recovery work. But we still want to observation of the gravitational wave rather soon. That is our hope. OK, let me summarize. Um, Atmospheric neutrino deficit was observed unexpectedly by proton decay experiments. And subsequently, in 1998, Super Kamiokande discovered neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrino submass. The discovery of non-zero neutrino mass opened the window to study physics beyond the standard model of particle physics. And neutrinos with small mass might also be the key to understand the fundamental questions of the universe. And well, I feel that I was really fortunate. I had very good advisors, colleagues, and I was involved in very good project. So final message to you is if we work hard and if we are fortunate, nature will kindly tell us the secret of it. OK, that's all from me. Thank you very much. You can have a seat here. That was yeah. a very fantastic talk. Thank you. So thank you, Professor Kajita. I, I think the entire audience truly enjoyed this talk. I actually spent some time reading up on your past papers to get more familiar with the topic, and it's, seeing you present is like not really quite the same. So I just wanted to start with something that I thought was pretty interesting. So you showed a photograph of the Super Kamiokande. That is a 50,000 ton facility, and it has 11,000 photomultiplier tubes or something massive yeah, like yeah, that. Yes. Can you share with us how hard it was to build something like that? Because compared to the original detector, the original facility, that one was only 3,000 tons. And I counted like maybe 10 people were involved in the construction. So this Super Kamiokande is more than 10 times larger than the first one, but you didn't have 10 times the number of people constructing it. So can you share a little bit about that? Well, in fact, the number of people in involved in Super Kamiokande construction was almost 10 times larger than the Kamiokande construction. <laughs> but anyway, the construction work was very hard. Well, uh, at the beginning of the 1995, the detector tank was uh, ready, and therefore we, had, we have to start the installation of the photo detectors. And in fact, it took uh, nearly one year. So about almost about one year, we were always in underground to construct the detector. I think it's really fantastic that you were also involved in the construction. I mean, the other question I just wanted to also ask was, there are all these photomultiplier tubes to, to detect the Cherenkov photons that are emitted through these neutrino oscillations. 
I think photomultiplier tubes have uh, maybe few percent sort of uncertainty. Were there any problems that you faced because your metrology, your metrology tools, for example, the PMT tubes were not good enough to measure? I, and do you still face these issues today? Yeah, well, thank you. Yes, well, certainly um, there are some limitations with the present day photomultiplier tubes. For example, we have to detect very low level photons. For example, typical signal is the one photoelectron. That is really just one electron is emitted by a conversion of photon to electron. So we have to observe this kind of very low photon, uh, pho photoelectron signal. But well, certainly, in, well, ideally, we should be able to count the number of photoelectrons, one, two, three, four. But the present day technology is not that advanced. Therefore, we have only a, say, broad uh, pulse height signal. So this kind of uh, limitation, we have to be very careful. Therefore, the simulation of the detector signal is extremely important. So, well, of course, we construct the detector itself, but at the same time, we construct a very serious model of the detector mm -hmm. in the computer. Yeah. So you had something to kind of back up what you were observing experimentally. Oh, no, no, not back up. This is comparison, for comparison. Mm -hmm. Well, by comparing the simulated signal and the real signal, yes. then we extract the uh, physics. Well, thank you. Um, I think there are a number of people that are lining up to ask questions. So can, maybe we'll start with this side. Uh, uh, hi, Yun uh, Smithers from the University of Cambridge. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. I wanted to ask, uh, how do you persuade uh, people to fund such massive projects um, when the, like, the human benefit is not as obvious? Well, I, I think we are all interested in neutrino physics. Therefore, it's not so difficult to, to ask them to work together. Hi, I'm David Azulay from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. You said that the, the mass of the neutrinos may explain why, the, why the, the presence of matter in the universe. So can you explain a little bit more, more on that? Hmm? Uh, S uh, sorry, could you say again? Like you, can you explain a little bit more on why the mass of the neutrinos uh, may explain the existence of matter? Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, well, the theoretical idea is like this. Well, first of all, in order to explain the very small neutrino mass, you need a particle that is like neutrinos, but extremely heavy. Because this particle is extremely heavy, as a result, the neutrino mass gets extremely small. This is the idea, first idea. Then this extremely heavy neutrino-like particle should have existed in the Big Bang universe because of the extremely high temperature. Then this extremely heavy neutrino-like particle should decay immediately to other particles. And during this decay, there, was a, there must have been a source for the baryon-dominated domina universe. This is the idea. And this is called um, CP violation. And this is, is the phenomena that neutrino physicists would like to observe in the next generation of experiments. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Professor Takari, for your talk. I'm a PhD from Vietnam, and I want to talk like uh, you spent many years in studying neutrinos and uh, universal. So how do you think about the time traveling? Like, can we back to the past? Because I already searched about the neutrinos and there are some ideas about that. Neutrinos probably have the speed more than the light. But uh, 
at the end, I found out like the, the speed of the neutrino is not like is not much compared to a light. So uh, there are some discussion on the internet like they said that the neutrinos might associate or related to the tram time traveling. So how do you think about that? Uh, your question is about the speed of neutrino. Uh, yeah, and uh, time traveling. Like if the neutrino has the speed more than the light, then people can back to the past. Okay, thank you for this question. Uh, first of all, well, I have no idea about the uh, neutrino speed above the speed of the light. This is clearly violating the uh, constraint from the relativity. So I think this should not happen. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Yes. Therefore, then, well, certainly, we, we know that neutrinos have mass. Uh, therefore, the neutrino speed should be slightly less than the speed of the light. But this effect is very, very small for neutrinos uh, I am talking today. So essentially, uh, well, neutrino sp speed is same as the speed of the light. Go ahead. Hi, Professor. Thank you for the talk. Um, so I'm Yaoji from Singapore. And I'd just like to ask you about extensions to the standard model. So the standard model is, in a sense, I think the crown jewel of fundamental physics. Um, but the Higgs field does not interact with the neutrino to give it the mass, right? But having a neutrino mass means there's um, a violation of that standard model. So in, what, in your opinion, how do we extend this model? Do you have a, like a primary candidate that, um, or in your opinion, does the model need to be revamped in, like in, in its entirety? Well, OK, thank you very much. Well, certainly, as I discussed, a neutrino mass is extremely small. And therefore, many people believe that the ordinary Higgs mechanism cannot explain the very small neutrino mass. And therefore, there are several ideas. Uh, well, actually, I already explained the idea to explain the very small neutrino mass. There must be neutrino-like very heavy particle. And with, because of this existence, the neutrino must get very, very small. And therefore, we think uh, what neutrino must suggest is not the violation of the standard model, just the extension of the standard model. Um, can I have a follow-up question? Yeah, so in terms of extensions of the standard model, could you not also get the same result from adding a right-handed neutrino to the model? Right-handed neutrinos is, in fact, yes. That, that should be included in the extended standard model. Thank you. Well, thank you, audience, for your very good questions. And thank you so much, Professor Kajita, for the, the best, most intuitive talk. We really enjoyed it. And you guys, uh, can we give him a big round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you so much.